Welcome to A Window on Samri, where we take you inside South Australia's independent not-for-profit health and medical research institute. Each episode, we get to know the people driving our life-changing research, getting into what motivates them personally and how their work is delivering a brighter, healthier future for all. Matt, where are you from originally? So originally, I grew up on the central coast of New South Wales um, on Gurungai land. I uh, was, yeah, born there, uh, raised there. And, but I've, I'm a, a, a Yamachi a Mulgana man. So it's Shark Bay or, or Gutha Gutta um, over in, in WA um, is where my people are from. Um, but yeah, grew up uh, about as far away from, from uh, you know, my, my, my people and my culture uh, on the East Coast as you can get. And what was life like for you growing up? You know, it, it's hard to sort of, um, I don't know, I guess, you know, quantify or compare um, to anyone. But, I mean, to us it was, it was easy, you know, good. Like we didn't, we didn't have a lot growing up. My parents had, um, you know, we grew up in a, in, a, in a pretty low socioeconomic part of Central Coast, you know, sort of in and around housing estate. Um, but, you know, it was, it was good, you know, it was full of love, um, you know, growing up in our household. And it was, you know, not much I could have asked for as a, as a you know, young child um, in, in that environment. You know, there's, there's certainly times when it was um, not the most stable of environments. And, um, but yeah, again, I, I sort of wouldn't change the early years for anything. What about your connection to your culture being that you were so far away from your people in WA? Yeah. So that was something that was difficult. Um, you know, having that real disconnectedness, like, you know, so common with a, a lot of Aboriginal people and particularly light skinned Aboriginal people. Um, so I'm a second generation, stolen generation. Um, so my grandfather uh, was taken uh, from his uh, hometown um, over in WA in Shark Bay and relocated um, to the east coast um, where he uh, you know, met my grandmother, had my father, um, and unfortunately, you know, series of events back in the, the 50s um, when the stolen generations were still very much alive, it was very difficult um, to have, you know, a, a dark uh, skinned, you know, Aboriginal child with a, with a white mother. So unfortunately, you know, my dad uh, never knew his dad um, growing up, and so he um, never knew who he, who his his mob were. Um, so he wasn't didn't grow up connected to his culture, and and, and you know because of that um, that disconnectedness, you know, led to a, a lot of um, you know social issues and, and also social withdrawal um, that you know my dad had an appetite for. So. For me, it was, um, you know, I always grew up knowing I was Aboriginal, but it was very, really difficult um, not having that exposure, I guess, um, to our culture and, and, you know, not having something for, um, you know, that community, you know, around. So, you know, I said we did sort of find one um, where we were of, of other Aboriginal people, um, but I guess, you know, obviously it, it wasn't the same as, as really knowing and connecting to your own culture and being in your own country. And what's the impact of that for a young Aboriginal person? Yeah, I guess, you know, when I was quite young, it was, you know, not something that um, I, I guess, you know, you really think about. You got your mates that are light skin, dark skin, you, you know, whatever it is. And, but you always sort of feel, um, you know, feel proud of this, this culture and this, this heritage. But sort of as I got older um, and, you know, started to get more involved um, with, you know, the Aboriginal communities um, on Gurungai and, and Darkenjung land on, on the Central Coast, um, it really started to, really started to embrace that that more and you know it, but it was really difficult like I said being my dad um I had a younger brother I have a younger brother as well um he's nine years younger than me um he's autistic and has cerebral palsy so he was you know like I said a lot younger and, and with his um developmental difficulties um at an early age it was difficult for him to connect so really my only connection to culture in my family was um my dad my mum was um of, of European descent so you know, that was really difficult because I said he didn't know whose people were. Um, so it was, you know, not something that um, we were exposed to a lot growing up. We knew we were Aboriginal, but we were always, it always felt like we, we were longing and, and yearning for something more, something something to really complete us and give us purpose. So, you know, I grew up very, very close um, to my dad um, until unfortunately, you know, he passed away about 10 years ago now. And where were you able to find that? that connection and um, to deepen that and, and have that become more a part of your life as you got older? Yeah, look, it probably wasn't, so we found out about 
you know, who we were as, as, as Mogana people. Um, when my dad was actually uh, in hospital just, just days before he died. Um, so he did get to find out? He got to find out about three, three or four days before he died. The, uh, the social worker um, at the hospital looked up my, my grandfather's naval records and found out, um, you know, he, uh, he enlisted, um, I think, in the late 40s um, in, in Fremantle and traced his records back um, to being born in, in Shark Bay, um, so the most westerly part of Australia. And that's where we really found out that, you know, Mulgana people and, and that is something that gave, um, you know, my dad moments for, you know, days before he died, really great gratitude and you know to know that he was um saltwater people has always grown up with a real affinity um for the water and the ocean and you know, worked on trawlers you know up in townsville for, for most of his life and um so to know that he had that connection to the sea and that sea felt like home to him was was you know really really helped him um and, you know, helped him find peace in those last few days so that was really big for us and and then following that um we were able to to you make i guess somewhat of a, of a a pilgrimage back to country uh, about three months after he, he, he passed away in 2013. Originally to try and find our grandfather. And so we went all the way to Shark Bay, which is not an easy place to get to. Um, you know, so we're going to fly into to Perth or Geraldton and then make a significant drive up and then west, um, north and west. And we asked around the towns, sort of, you know, we knew his name, Cross, and we asked a lot of people. And, um, you know, sort of, uh, long story short, everyone knew who he was. And so we just immediately ran into so many cousins, aunties, uncles, you know, family and they said he's living on the East Coast and <laughs> living on the East Coast and, and, you know, he comes back every now and then for, for sorry business and things like that, but he's been there pretty well his whole adult life. Um, turned out we found out he was living in, in a place called Lewisham in Sydney. At that time I was living in a place called Leichhardt and they're literally one kilometre away from each other. <laughs> no way. They're separated by Parramatta Road. Oh, that's crazy. I used to ride my bike. You went all that way. <laughs> all that way. All that way to the most westerly point of Australia, yeah. uh, about the first place you can get from Sydney. And, um, yeah, found out who he was, uh, where he was, and, and found out um, his phone number and his address and uh, from, from his niece. And, um, yeah, we had to go and knock on his door and, and find out that he was still alive. You know, I think he's 80, 82 um, or 83 with, uh, you know, various health, um, you know, conditions that he was managing, but um, he was alive and we got to connect with him, um, which was just something, you know, so grateful for. Uh, it's better have that opportunity and, and he was able to really teach us, um, you know, a lot about our culture and, and, you know, tell us a lot about his story and fill in so many, so many gaps. Um, so that was, you know, a really beautiful and, and surreal moment and we got to spend quite a few years with him. Um, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, he passed away as well. What was it like for him to find out who you were and have you rock up at his door only a K away from your house? Yeah, again, I can still remember that moment. You know, it was um, it, it was something that it's it's really hard to describe and put into words. You know, it, it was so surreal. Um, but he was, you know, had had early onset stages of, of dementia, and and, and um, so he was, you know, during his lucid moments, um, were, were fantastic. We were able to really connect and. And like I said, his long-term memory was still fantastic. So he's been able to tell us so many stories, but yeah. you know, he, uh, I was living in Brisbane at the time, but, um, so I only got to come down and, and see him, you know, uh, sort of sporadically, but my younger brother, um, by this stage, he was now sort of a late teenager and he, um, you know, took, took our, our grandfather, Frank, um, back home, um, to the central coast. Um, so he was able to, you know, get him out of his, his a really, you know, dilapidated house and, and get him to some, some better housing so he could have a relationship with him. And, you know, I really commend my, my brother for that. It sort of gave my brother a lot of purpose after our dad died um, to, to really connect with, with our grandfather and, and connect with his culture. And, and so I said, yeah, giving him you know, a tremendous purpose. And it was, it was great for, for myself as well, you know, to really start connecting and understanding, you know, a lot more about, about who we are and, and where we come from. And it, um, it, it made a lot of things make sense. Yeah, well, what an amazing journey to, mm, to find all that out and go all that way and then find that that connection was back at home pretty much and then to still have him be alive. That's just phenomenal. That's so cool. Certainly. How has it added to your sense of wanting to serve and wanting to build your community, your aspirations? How have they developed out of your background? Yeah, it's something, like I said, it gave me – it gave me such such power um, being able to to connect um, to pop and like I said I was living in Brisbane at the time I was just finishing up my degree 
Um, and, you know, I chose to, as soon as I finished, instead of following a, um, uh, uh, the sort of lineal path, I guess, from doing a health science degree into that field, um, I, I knew I just wanted to go and work with community. Um, so, you know, I, I took up a job with IUE. Um, Institute of Urban Indigenous Health in Brisbane, uh, facilitating daily choices programs. You know, it's going to schools and and yarning with kids, nice. um, you know, primary school and um, and secondary school age kids around, you know, trying to make the best sort of you know lifestyle choices um, to to set them up for success uh, for later in life. And you know that was that was amazing, you know, doing that and being able to connect. And I felt um I felt such a, a an urge and and an obligation, you know, to to give back. To community, um, especially during that time, and, and something I still feel quite strongly, you know, about now, and, and I feel especially, you know, whilst a lot of um, a lot of things like you know chronic health and incarceration and poverty and all that sort of thing that affects a lot of Aboriginal people have really affected me and my family. Um, growing up, I still felt that I had so much more privilege. Um, you know, than a lot of Aboriginal people that live in community, and and so I really felt that obligation that I needed to use my position and and my fortunate, very fortunate position that you know I was able to have a, a good schooling education and um, had these opportunities later in life that you know we sort of be able to to create for ourselves um, to go and use that and to, and to use that and to give back. So that was that's what really drove that. And then ever since then, I've worked in you know um, in some capacity or another, um, you know, with Aboriginal communities. So how'd you get involved at Samri? Yeah, so I've been at Samri for a little over three months now. So I came here from the Cancer Council uh, of South Australia, um, moved here from Brisbane uh, a bit over two years ago now, and in previous role was, you know, working with Aboriginal uh, prevention. Um, so, you know, trying to work with in, enhance um, community participation in, in cancer screening, you know, bowel, cervical, breast, things like that, and, and soon to be um, lung next year. And, um, so really, yeah, you said yarning with community around that and holding workshops and, and trying to increase participation rates. And um, did you have much success with that? Yeah, we we did. Probably not as much as I would have liked. Hence, sort of, I decided to look, um, you know, to somewhere I can have a bigger impact because you know, look, our hands were tied for things for you know financial things, for example, trying to get in, into community where we could have the most reach and impact was difficult at times. And, you know, I was the only Aboriginal person at the Cancer Council as well at the time, um, which was really difficult to sort of get a lot of continuity because you're mm -hmm. carrying a lot of cultural load yeah. uh, for an organisation. Very different to Samri. Extremely different. So, you know, I want to go to a place um, like the, the Wadley Paringa um, you know, Aboriginal health equity theme there um, where I can be amongst, um, you know, Aboriginal colleagues in, in, a, in a safer environment, um, culturally safe environment. And, and that already have the, the credibility, um, the platform to, to, you know, do better work and, and, and greater work with community. So, yeah, it sort of it brought me over there to, to work on this this current project, um, which I'm, you know, really excited about doing something I can, you know, get my, um, sink my teeth into, get my hands on and, and you know, before we look at, you um, yeah, heading off to med school next year. And what is that project? So we're working on part of the diabetes foot complications project in the Walk Strong, Walk Tall team. Uh, we're working on um, enacting some recommendations from the Enhancing Amputation Care for Aboriginal People in South Australia, uh, papers that, that Samri co-authored and published uh, 2022, I believe. Um, so one of those recommendations was to look at enhancing Aboriginal um, education uh, and resources around um, you know, amputation as a result of, of diabetes complications. So we're looking to to hold some workshops with Aboriginal lived experience people um, with amputations and um, get their, their their guidance and their feedback um, in terms of how difficult it was and some of the challenges that they had navigating, um, you know, the health systems, um, particularly that of um, Carlin, so the, the Central Adelaide Local Health, Local health Network. And yeah, so try to understand what some of those barriers were and, and trying to create some resources to help, um, you know, future Aboriginal people navigate those systems, you know, through fr from consent um, of, of um, amputation because they're quite often presenting in very acute stages, um, triaged very acutely, and um, it's often, you know, life-saving um, surgery and amputation that they need. So helping to understand um, the consent process for that, what's going to happen with their limb as well and their options um, and their entitlements to their limb 
because uh, it's very important if Aboriginal people to you know have their limbs and, and be, be buried whole um, when that day does come so they can pass into the dreaming um, complete. So, yeah, so that that's that's pretty much the project and then we'll be looking to, like I said, create a series of resources um, on that from consent through to re- the rehabilitation process so they can better navigate that. And what have you found about the challenges in that space since you've started three months ago, sort of roadblocks that you come up against and, and things that, that you've learned already? Yeah, um, I guess sort of understanding it, you know, from a, from a real sensitivity standpoint is, um, has been something, you know, I'm learning um, and, and how to navigate that. I mean, it, it's something that is a very, you know, I, I, for anyone, not just Aboriginal people, but it's a very traumatic experience. Um, so sort of understanding how, you know, t- to navigate that and, and give a voice to people who want to speak about it in, in a safe environment um, and how to approach that safely is sort of something that, you know, we're, we're developing and learning. Um, I'm very fortunate to be part of a, you know, a great team who've been part of this project for several years now um, and got a lot of experience in it. So I'm, I'm, you know, leading on the team a lot, which has been, you know, phenomenal um, to, you know, really welcoming. Um, so, yeah, blessed in that in that regard. Um, but certainly, you know, we're just looking at, um, you know, we're holding this workshop in, in July um, to then, you know, really kickstart and we need to have this this project complete or just about complete uh, for the resources ready to be rolled out and disseminated um, by the time our contract finishes and med school starts um, early next year. What do you get out of working side by side with your colleagues, given that you were the only Aboriginal person at your last job? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, see, that is a hard one. Um, <laughs> it's, it's something that I guess it's, um, you know, really did start affecting me quite negatively um, in my previous position. And, and look, you know, that that's that's no disrespect to Cairns Council. They're a wonderful organisation. They do some great work. But it was um, the reality of the situation I had there. And, you know, now to be in an environment with, you know, so many um, esteemed, you know, Aboriginal colleagues that I've looked up to, you know, for a long time, um, is, is just phenomenal to have that support and, you know, to have um, the, the facilities there where they're, it's always, they're always looking to, to um, promote um, anything with culture. Um, you know, there, there's no, there's no shame in it there. There's, there's no cultural load. They're, they're constantly, you know, looking after, um, you know, our best interests and like I said, being able to lean on, on people with, you know, such tremendous experience and, and skin in the game has been a phenomenal learning experience for me, but um, as well as I said, just holding a really safe cultural space. Yeah, well, it's certainly something that Samri excels in and prides itself on, and so it should. We obviously were part of the referendum last year and, and witnessed some of the impact that that had, mm. but perhaps just from your perspective, talk about the impact of that on yourself personally first and then on uh, on your colleagues as well from what you've seen this year at Samri. Yeah, look, it's something that, um, you know, obviously at the time, um, Personally, there was it, it. It was hard to not see the writing on the wall. Um, you know, in the in the weeks leading up to the referendum, you know, we still like to have some some hope that we would be recognised. Um, you know, uh, and given given an opportunity uh, to to better influence uh, policymakers on you know providing. Providing that, that that help and assistance that you know we need as 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 a as a cultural people, um, and so yeah, we I was fairly confident that it was going to get um, get rejected leading up to it. So it, it's 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 like you know someone who like personally who, who's been through you know the the loss, um, you know, watching my brother, my dad, my grandfather all get cancer and, and slowly deteriorate and die. You sort of know what's coming. But it still doesn't make it any easier, and uh, the referendum was similar to that, obviously, and probably a, a, in parts slightly lesser scale. But it um, it was very difficult, you know, very very difficult to to get through that and and to not take it personally, to not take it as a personal a personal judgment and a personal attack of this country to Aboriginal people. And have you seen that? feeling reciprocated by your colleagues since you've been at, at Samri. I know it took the wind out of people's sails, understandably, yeah. and it was pretty upsetting for the broader Samri community. We largely certainly support that, um, to have that result come through. How's that, uh, I know you weren't part of the team last year, but how's yeah. that impacted 
just the the general vibe around research and um, at at Samri especially. Yeah, certainly. I think um, I think for the most part, you know, Aboriginal people are very resilient people. You know that that needs to be that needs to be stated. And I think um, I think it, it it strengthened the resolve of a lot of people there to obviously initially have you know, having some of the yarns we've had with some of some of the, my colleagues. Um, similar feelings to mine of, of, of mourning and sorrow and, and to not take it as a very personal attack. But I think um, given that a lot of the people there um, were focusing on, on what they could control and, and sort of using that um, using that to motivate them and, and you know, determined, like I said, to, to have that resolve um, to keep pushing forward with the work they're doing. However, it, it's still there and it's still very it's, – it's sitting right below the surface. You know, for an example, we had a um, – the Aboriginal Collective of Samri got together uh, recently and watched a, uh, it was an online workshop um, of some colleagues at, at TK, TKI um, over in WA um, and they were, they were yarning on on, um, on the referendum and, and sort of what the experience and the fallout was for them and, and then they very, very briefly touched on where to from here um, and the collective, uh, the Aboriginal Collective, were not, anticipating that that's what was the content was going to be and it really knocked everyone around and it really took the wind out of the sails um for, for the colleagues so that really you know sort of highlighted that it is still sitting there just below the surface it's still very raw very raw um and and, and you know sort of stirred up a lot of emotions for a lot of people myself included um and i got you know visibly upset and as as did most of the people um that, that were that were witnessing that so yeah it, it's um it's something that's still very sensitive, for yeah, sure. and of course, not something that you're just going to forget about. No. Move on with, even when it might feel like the rest of the country just can, can just do that because perhaps it didn't affect them as directly. But mm. how do you approach moving forward after th- that result? Um, in just going about your work day, working on a project like you're working on, is it, a, is it a driver or do you sort of try to keep it out of your mind and just keep things simple and, and try to make things better in your lane? Yeah, I think that's a, a really important one is, is to focus on what you can control. Um, and, and at times, you know, if you need to revert back to your little three-foot world, then for safety, then that's something you need to do at times. Um, you know, I think I think the response from um, the Aboriginal communities, you know, across the country for, to things like this, uh, you know, most recent rec week um, and – you know, now more than ever and the messaging around that, um, you know, it, again, is really trying to strengthen that resolve and, and, and trying to really bring together uh, Aboriginal community. And I, and I feel that, you know, for the large part, we've become a lot tighter, you know, and 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 that's, like I said, you, you're dealing with um, Miss Aboriginal people, you know, obviously a lot of many different, you know, hundreds of language groups and many different cultures and, and, and traditions and all that sort of stuff and law and ceremony and so very different, but it's really united um, Aboriginal people from what I've been seeing in the office and what I've seen in the community. Um, so that's been, that's been, you know, real positive to see from that um, and that is, you know, inspiring and uplifting um, to keep going with what we're doing um, and then obviously, you know, coming into to NAIDOC week now around keeping that fire burning and, and being black, loud and proud. I think these, these messaging is key um, to, to, to bring that um, solidarity, you know, together for Aboriginal people um, in community, but as, as well as, as the team at Samri. So optimistic? Yeah, look, certainly. I think I think you have to be. I think you have to be. I think you have to, you know, when you look back on, when you look back on, you know, the trailblazers that we've had um, in this country, Aboriginal trailblazers, and what they've been able to do um, from, you know, the context that they've been brought up in was extremely different, but also extremely more difficult. And I think you need to draw inspiration and strength, um, from them to, to keep going, you know, with it, you know, especially our elders, um, you know, which who are absolutely everything, um, you know, to Aboriginal people and, you know, really, really relying, um, on them and looking to them, um, you know, t- to lead, um, and unite and which, you know, we've got some fantastic people that are doing and you look at the, the, the voice, the parliament, that SA, you know, has, has put through as the only state so far. Um, we're hoping more, more will join us. Um, but that's been, you know, that was, that was a fantastic initiative. Um, so I think, you know, we've had the elections in March this year and um, we now have, I think it's 47 or 49 um, candidates across the state in, in six regions, seven regions. 
um, you know, that are, that are looking to you know, be the voice of their communities and, and their and their people. Um, so, you know, really hoping that that is going to carry some some weight um, in terms of you know the direction of, of policy making and and things that we can use and to really implement um, you know life on the ground for community to to, to ameliorate that and make it better. Mm. And you're clearly a leader in your own right, and you're also a family man. Uh, tell us about your your young kids yeah yeah so i got a couple of young kids um beautiful wife um so my daughter isla she's two um she is uh adorable but she's a menace um like i'm I'm sure it's the experience of many uh you know um two small child households at the i'm hearing a very common theme the second one is a bit wild yeah um so she's uh she's great fun um but She's gonna be a little terror. Um, my older older fella, um, Ollie, Oliver. He's a he's a real sweet natured kid. Um, you know, he's he's my little buddy. Um, you know, of course, as he's Isla, but um, you know, when you've got one of each, you sort of <laughs> often pair up um, when you're doing stuff. And you know, mum gets Isla ready, and I get Ollie ready. And um, yeah, no, nah, so they're 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 great kids. Um, certainly keeps you on your toes, you know, having a couple of young kids and, yeah. you know, working full time and studying part time and commuting and everything else you're trying to balance. You're just trying to make, um, you know, the, trying to leave this world in, in the best position you can for them um, to grow up and, and, and prosper in, um, you know, sort of really all you can do. So how do you balance it when you're not at work? You're obviously busy, but. Yeah, certainly am, you know, but it's, um, I, I'm very fortunate that I've, I've always had the mentality that, um, you know, work will always be there. There will always be more work you can do. But when my, you know, when my foot leaves the office, it's in my rear view mirror for that, for the rest of that day. You know, I, I have very, very strong boundaries around that. It's family time is family time. And, and, and that's the most important thing to me, bar none, um, you know, family, family and community. Um, so yeah, so get home, you know, the young fellow loves fishing at the moment. So you always go down to your grandparents' place down in Gore and go for a bit of a flick and, um, you know, mostly pulling in carp, but he, he loves it. He, he's, you know, got a, <laughs> I used to do that actually, Ingle, Ingle when I was that age, and used to pull out carp out of that out of that same uh, area of water. I you reckon. can't you can't beat it. You know, such great fun, great value for money. You know, you're paying two bucks for a tin of corn, and uh, and away you go. There's a couple of hours yeah. of entertainment right there. They're not not good eating, but <laughs> certainly, I mean, certainly, not. I've, I've um, you know, there are there are certainly people that uh that that you know will swear by it. Um, you know, my. European <laughs> family for one of them. Yeah, a little, um, little bit on the bony side. A little bit on the bony and side. And the dirty side. A little bit on the dirty side, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, being bottom feeders. Fun to catch, uh, though. They are very fun to catch. You know, like gear. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, so he, he loves that. And, you know, so it's something we try and do quite a lot. You know, I like have, having that um, that father-son bonding time. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, Isla, when um, when she's uh, not being a menace and a terror, we, um, you know, like to get her around. She's got just got her, like a little electric motorbike, so she sort of scoots around the neighbourhood in that and, yeah, it does wheelies and burnouts and stuff and terrorizes all the other kids. Nice. So. Old school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not on the iPad yet. <laughs> nah, trying to keep them off that as much as possible, mate. Um, you know, we said, yeah, our generation grew up without that. And, um, you know, playing footy on the street and all those sort of things in, in community. And, and that's, you know, we, we really want to try and instill that still as difficult as it is, as it is in this day and age um, to still have that. But, um, yeah, trying to trying to leave my kids, like I said, and have them experience some of the things, the, the benefits I got to experience in, in my time growing up. That sounds pretty good to me. And you're looking at studying medicine now, so, so yes, what's, what's the plan after this year? Yeah, plan is, so I was very fortunate this year to be accepted um, at Flinders, um, the, their um, Indigenous Entry Stream for Postgraduate Medicine. Oh, so congratulations. That's a, thank you, sir. Uh, so yeah, it's four year, four year postgrad. Um, so as part of that IES program, we do this, um, it's like a, like a pre-med uh, year this year, so it's an online, just some basic learning of, of sciences. Um, you know, molecules, chemistry, biology, that sort of thing, and just sort of rehashing what I've already done in my in my health science undergrad, although albeit some time ago. So it's been nice to have this little recap. Um, and then you know, actually fly up to Darwin in a couple of weeks to do some of the more um, the practical applications of, of things, you know, learning how to palpate and percuss and you know, how to use a spigma manometer and things like that. So um, again, which I've all done before, so it's, it's more just a rehash type thing. So I'm really excited for that. But yeah, for the future, Four years going you know, to be there, so you know it's going to be difficult. Um, my, my time at Samri will, will probably um, cease at least in, in a permanent capacity uh, once we start that. I'd love to hang around if I can, but it's going to take some juggling of full time med school, kids commuting from Strathalbyn, all that sort of thing. So, 
But yeah, no, really, really excited for that. I haven't, I don't think I've ever wanted anything for my own personal development more than this. And it's something that, you know, I really want to use uh, to take back to community. You know, that that's that's my aim, whether, if, you know, would that be in a, in a permanent position somewhere with the RFDS or, you know, potentially even going back to country, going back to Shark mm. Bay and be able to be, you know, a, a doctor. A, um, so you're thinking clinician stream, clinician research, or maybe a combo of, of the two or which one? Yes. Look, it, it, this... um. Working at, at Ken's Council in Samaria was sort of my, my first foray into, into public health promotion and, and research, um, which I have enjoyed aspects of it, certainly. But my, my preference really is to be uh, a clinician first. Um, it's what I really enjoy, you know, running my, my nutritional consultation practice um, since completing my undergrad. And um, I love working with people. I, I love looking at the problem and investigating and, and you know, digging deeper and asking questions. And, and I love, you know, treating the body as a whole um, and, you know, not merely symptomatic um, in treatment, but looking at the cause um, of disease. And I think um, you know, potentially looking at like integrative medicine that way, um, I, I think would be, you know, what I want to do at this stage, but, you know, it's four years away and that might change a hundred times. And by the time I get into, you know, internships and rotations and all that sort of thing, I might completely change into something else. But that's, you know, that's what I'm thinking at this stage, you know, based on my experience thus far. And But I know that, you know, I'll, just want to give back, um, you know, to community. There's there's so many health disparities and gaps that really need to be ameliorated desperately. And again, like I said before, I feel obligated um, to be able to do that to to use you know my, my fortunate position to be able to do that and to to help help mob. Well, you're already obviously doing heaps of good for community, and you sound like the man for the job to me. We're lucky to have you at Samory while we do, mate. So good on you. Thank you very much, Carl. Appreciate it. If you want to learn more about Samri and the researchers working to build a brighter, healthier future for you and your family, head to samri.org.au.